Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Units of History Sassanid Horse Archers by Invicta. So, I've had Invicta recommended to me many times, and we're finally getting to this channel. Now, this video in particular I chose because it's been recommended, and we've done a fair amount of content on the Sassanid Persian Empire before, so I thought it would be interesting to take a look at an important unit from that empire, the Horse Archers. I'm excited to see what we can learn in this video. If you guys end up enjoying this one, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, where you can get access to exclusive reaction content. It's linked down in the description. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. The horse archers of the East were known far and wide as masters of their craft, whose coming struck fear into the hearts of their foes. Yet while Western sources can certainly tell us what it was like to be on the receiving end of such attacks, they prove far less capable of providing details about the faceless hordes which assailed them from a distance. In this series, it will be our goal to bring life to the rich history of these Eastern warriors. Today, let us ride with the Sassanid horse archers. All right, great. You can learn much more about the ferocious horse archers of history through our sponsor, Magellan TV. Their series, Warrior's Way, does a fantastic job bringing to life units of various civilizations, including the Norse, Scots, Celts, Romans, and more. Mmm, the Scots. Now there's a good one. As always, go and check out their video, check out their sponsor, show them support for making this content. You know, we got to appreciate our history content creators, so... Go and check out their video, it's linked in my description, uh, and show them the support they deserve. Um, yeah, excited to get into these Sassanid horse archers, though. You know, getting a closer look at what made up the Sassanid Persian military, who we've seen fighting many times against many foes, the Romans in particular, of course. Watch Warrior's Way, or any documentary that catches your interest, by clicking the link in the description below. We're going to try.magellantv.com slash Invicta to get a one month free trial. Enjoy. Nice. The Sassanid horse archers were the inheritors of a long tradition that stretched back millennia to the first Indo-European yep. settlers. A long tradition that stretched back millennia and would continue for a long, long time. We're talking about nomadic steppe horse archers whether we're talking about them in this context or any of many different contexts, they were always a formidable foe, uh, especially, usually, against settled peoples, against empires. They could be quite a dangerous threat. Who arrived in the Iranian plateau. It is in these early years that people of the region began to develop independent traditions of archery and horsemanship, which would eventually merge. Soon, an evolutionary arms race was underway among the various powers which wrestled for control of the region. Hmm. This was further accelerated by frequent competition with steppe forces, which were always on the bleeding edge of horse archery. Yes, that's and that's what I was just referencing. We're looking at the tradition of Eastern, or maybe you would call it sort of Central Asian horse archers. And when you're looking at that tradition, the steppe tribes, the steppe peoples, are going to be one of the first places you look. It only took a few centuries before a few scattered soldiers were transformed into units, regiments, and armies. These would feature prominently in the militaries of the various empires which rose and fell across the East, with yep. each incarnation of the horse archer leaving its mark on those which followed. Unfortunately, a comprehensive study of this topic will be outside the scope of our episode. <laughs> yeah, well, this is just on the Sassanid horse archers already taking 25 minutes long, and you could do a lot more time just on this unit in particular. So to do a comprehensive examination <laughs> and analysis of these horse archers from this region throughout history, my goodness, imagine the amount of time that would take. We will therefore have to skip over the contributions of countless generations 
and be satisfied with discussing the passing of the baton which occurred during the fall of the Parthians and the rise of the Sassanids. All right, let's focus in. The former had been established in 247 BC when King Arashk I of the Eastern Iranian tribe known as the Parni had rebelled against the Seleucids. In time, his dynasty would expand across the land, rising to become heirs of the ancient Archaemenid Empire. Mm. As such, they were able to wield considerable military forces, which proved capable of holding their own against the Romans. Yeah, and the Persians or Iranians, whichever label you want to use, had several of these massive, powerful empires, uh, especially around this time, sort of during ancient history. We can look at the Achaemenids, the Parthians, the Sassanids, etc., etc., etc. We saw that in Epimetheus's video and a lot of these different Persian empires. And of course, each successive empire would take things from the former empires, but it would also do things a little differently. So it's interesting. We're seeing, you know, a lot of these Iranian Persian empires, but different iterations each one doing things a bit differently, but also similarly in many ways. And of course, this is also going to apply to military affairs. You know, things, including the units of warfare, are going to evolve, change, and adapt over time. However, unlike their predecessors, the Parthian system of rule was far more decentralized than that of the Archaemenids. Thus, the four and a half centuries of their rule was often subject to crippling bouts yeah. of internal unrest. Well, the Achaemenids sort of became this great empire that Persian empires in the future would look back to and try to emulate, um, and you could argue with how much success they had. It was during one of these episodes in the early 3rd century AD that Ardashir I came to control the province of Pars, from mm. which he staged a revolt and then a conquest of the civil war-stricken Parthians. Doing so was not just a great feat of military achievement, but also of diplomacy, as the elements of the former Parthian Empire were now reforged into the new Sassanid yep. Empire. And there you go. Now you have the Sassanids. And you can see, you know, they've been bordering Rome. The Parthians had plenty of conflict with Rome. Um, you know, the Persians and the Romans were sort of these mortal enemies, these rivals who would continually fight against each other, but also had some level of respect for one another. Uh, and that was true for the Parthian Empire and was very true for the Sassanid Empire. I mean, the Sassanid Empire and the Roman Empire, then the Eastern Roman Empire, would be enemies until the end. Until the Sassanid Empire fell, they'd be fighting. <laughs> While the descendants of Ardashir would reign as the Shahanshah, or King of Kings, yep. the House of Sassan would rely to a great degree on the support of the other powerful clans of the realm. Mm -hmm. Chief among these were the seven great Parthian houses, which had formed the bedrock of the prior administration. And we've seen throughout other series, I'm particularly thinking of our series on Kosro, how this could be a problem. <laughs> now, of course, it's very difficult to rule on your own. You need some help. And oftentimes throughout history, monarchs or kings of kings or, you know, whatever kind of leader you're talking about will rely on some sort of noble structure. These powerful families who hopefully they can work through and work with. But... When you have a system like this, there's going to be some competition between these noble houses and the guy at the top. And so there can be a lot of tension there, and sometimes you got to bring your nobles back into line. So it's sort of an interesting, and it can be a dangerous system to work within. Keeping them in line was one of the great <laughs> tensions of yep. Sasanian history. Exactly. This appears to have been done by way of a strong central authority, and more robust means of domestic control. Yep. One of the most evident manifestations of this power was the new Sassanid army, known as the Espar. Hmm. As with the earlier Parthians, its core was made up of an elite cavalry force, which was known as the Savaran. Drawn largely from the upper classes, its members fought both in close quarters and at range. 
This body was in turn supported by regional forces, mercenaries and allies. Unlike the Parthians, these featured a greater diversity of troop types with a notably higher proportion of infantry. Hmm. A thorough exploration of the Espar's various branches will have to be covered in another video. For okay. now, let us look... I mean, look, this is how it is with history. When you're covering one topic in particular, you tend to brush up against a hundred other topics that you could go into and spend several hours on, but <laughs> we have to leave them for now. But this is a lot of stuff that we've also touched on in other videos. Specifically, at the Sassanid Horse Archers. These hailed from a wide variety of locations and consequently were a rather diverse force. Interesting. Yeah, and very interesting to see the role they played because, I mean, they are a very important unit and we know the influence they had. Um, but it's interesting comparing the ESPA, uh, as they said it was called, to, say, the Roman military. Uh, if you look at the Roman military, there is far more an emphasis on heavy infantry. Though, of course, if we're talking about the Sassanids, we're getting fairly late in the Roman Empire. Things are changing, but you get my point. The horse archers are something obviously not unique to the Sassanids. <laughs> I mean, there are horse archers just about everywhere in this region, but it is an interesting element of this military in particular. I'll put it that way. For the sake of simplicity, such horse archers can generally be divided into two broad groups based on their origins. The first group consisted of those recruited from the provinces of the historical and cultural Iranian realm known mm. as the Iran, while the second group were those which came from beyond this region, or the An-Iran. <laughs> and, you know, we have the modern country of Iran, <laughs> right? It's always interesting to see you have this sort of core, this Iranian core with Iranian culture and all that sort of business, and then over time, we see a bunch of these Iranian slash Persian empires that extend uh, to different lengths. You know, they are larger or smaller, but we do hold on to this sort of core of culture uh, and a certain way of doing things. Uh, I mean, even to this day, of course, we have the modern country of Iran, and a lot of that ancient culture has been preserved uh, in one way or another. The core of the Iran included the regions of Pars, Medea, and Parthia, whose militarized noble families provided much of the manpower of the elite-mounted Savaran. Surrounding these were other important regions which tended to manifest as auxiliaries. They included the important warrior tribes of Gelan, Gurgan, the Iranian Plateau, and Sakastanis. Yet further afield would be the peoples of the frontier who served as auxiliaries or mercenaries. Mm. The Caucasus, for instance, were a prominent recruitment center for horse archers with the Khazars, Alans, Savants, ah. Sabirs, and Sunati providing many warriors. Interesting. And here we see something that's rather similar to, say, the Roman military uh, of the same era, roughly, in that, you know, you have a core of troops, but then as you expand outwards, you start using auxiliaries either from the frontiers of your own territory or maybe even beyond your own territory. Uh, of course, this is a good way to bolster your own forces, but, you know, it can lead to problems over time. Uh, look at many different empires throughout history. Sassanid kings also worked hard to secure the support of Central Asian forces, such as the Kushans and various Zhongnu-related peoples, like the Hephthalites, Kianites, and Turkic tribesmen. Yeah, we're getting a lot of interesting names mentioned. The Hephthalites, uh, they would actually be a sort of a big nuisance for the Sassanids uh, until a certain point. The Hephthalites were this rather powerful people who for a long time would threaten sort of, I suppose, the eastern border of the Sassanid Empire. Uh, the Khazars or the Khazars were mentioned earlier. Uh, they'd be a tribe that would stick around in the region, prominent to both the Sassanid Persians and to the Romans, even after the Sassanid Empire fell. So some real interesting names, plus many more that I may not have heard of or that I can't get further information on, but a lot of interesting stuff going on here. It was an eclectic group, but all yeah. were united by a common way of life defined by a reverence of the bow and saddle. 
Mm. Let us now take a look at how they might be equipped for war. Ooh, okay, great. Again, it must be stated that this would have varied wildly and been subject to the particularities of each individual soldier. Yeah, this is a massive generalization. And by the way, when we're talking about ancient warfare, or really sort of any pre-modern warfare, you know, anytime we look at the average soldier or the average unit, it's going to be a massive generalization. You know, sure, if we look today, in very recent times, armies are professionalized, you know, everyone's wearing the same uniform, uh, the same equipment, etc., etc., generally, but really, if you look throughout history before that, most armed forces that we're going to look at had an incredible amount of diversity in the type of troop, the equipment, what they wore, all that sort of stuff. So, yes, this is very generalized, but we all know that, so just keep that in mind. We will, nonetheless, endeavor to present a generalized view. Yes. For starters, most soldiers would have donned loose-fitting trousers, boots, and a knee-length tunic that was bound with a belt. Mm. Their head might be bare or covered by a cap. The pointed kulaf hat appears to have been associated with the Sasanian nobility. For many of the lighter cavalry, this would have been it for their defense. Speed would have been their best means of avoiding danger. Yet we have many depictions of horse archers being equipped with far more substantial gear, particularly among the nobles of the Savran. This may have included scale or mail shirts with more advanced combined armor styles. And I think this is absolutely worth noting, they said, particularly amongst the nobility. Now, when we talk about troops of this era, we're particularly talking about horse archers here. But if you wanted to go a little broader, just talk about troops in general, whether in the Persian armies or in the Roman armies, what you're going to find is that I think your average soldier would probably be less armored than you might expect, and one of the reasons why, uh, and this is especially true as time goes on and we get further from the heyday <laughs> of, uh, you know, the powerful Persian and Roman empires, um, one of the reasons this is true is because armor is expensive, and a lot of times these troops were left to outfit themselves. So sure, if you're a powerful and wealthy noble, then you can afford to wear heavy armor. Uh, if it's worth wearing, for some troops, of course, it would just slow them down. But for a lot of troops, uh, regardless of the kind of troop we're talking about, I'm mainly thinking of infantry, you know, they might just have to go with whatever they can afford or whatever they've been given, which might not be more than some rather light armor <laughs> compared to what many of us may think about when we think of soldiers of this era. Once again, this is a massive generalization, but something that I think you would generally find accurate. Additional pieces might then be adopted to cover the thigh, shin, and forearm. Helmets, meanwhile, were also fairly common. Finds from earlier centuries reveal many conical and ridge helmets with hanging male sides, while mm. later centuries reveal an increase in more sophisticated pieces, such as the Sasanian Spangen helm. Ooh. Based on the wealth of the warrior, these may have been inlaid with precious metals yep. and adorned with jewels. For offense, the primary weapon of a horse archer was a... So right now we have the picture of the heaviest armored horse archer you can imagine. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is not how most of them would have looked, but some of them would have looked like this, and most of them would have had some degree uh, of armor going on. It just would not have been uniform powerful composite bow known mm. to the Persians as the Kaman. Its core was made of a mixture of different types of wood with Ooh. animal horn being added to the front and sinew being added to the back. The bow was then painted and oiled. Such designs were common in the East at the time, being favored for their strength, flexibility and ability to remain strung for long periods of time. As a backup, Savaran horse archers are said to have carried two spare bow strings, or zay. This was all carried in a dedicated bow case, or kamandar, with 30 arrows being carried in their own quiver, or tiadan. This is to be contrasted with the earlier Parthian practice of housing both 
in a single gory toss case. Mm. Horse archers may have strapped or slung these individual items across their body as they saw fit. However, in later centuries, they would adopt the lappet suspension system, which allowed for better control of one's gear. Sassanid arrows, or tigra, usually measured around 80 to 85 centimeters in length with wooden shafts and feathered fletchings. Heads varied widely based on their intended battlefield use, with tang and barbed designs appearing commonly in archaeology. For the purposes of firing these arrows, horse archers used all manner of finger rings, guards, hmm. and other devices. One fascinating piece of kit was the noak. It was a guide track which rested along the bow face, allowing one to overdraw a projectile. Huh. I mean, it almost looks a bit like a crossbow when you frame it like that. Very interesting. So, I mean, I am not familiar with archery, not in a historical sense and not in a uh, practical sense either. So, I can't say much about the type of bow used, the type of equipment, that sort of thing. But maybe some of you are, and I'd be interested to hear if you're more familiar with archery, especially uh, if you've actually practiced, uh, what you think about this setup, how it might be different from other types of equipment used. I'm very interested to hear from anybody who might have some experience with this. Researchers believe it was commonly used to fire small darts which could be carried in far greater numbers than traditional arrows. Other weapons carried by horse archers were also numerous. This could have ranged anywhere from simple daggers to axes, spears, swords, maces, and more. Wow. Considering that heavy cavalry often served hybrid roles, some would have also sported lances. Mm. As for the horse's gear, Early riders used simple cloth saddles or four-horn variants. By the late 500s AD, stirrups began to be adopted. Wow. And I think it's really interesting and absolutely worth mentioning that, you know, we're talking about a fairly wide span of time. Now, we're just talking about the Sassanid Empire. Like they said, if they broadened it even further, well, we'd probably never stop talking. But even just looking at the Sassanids, we're talking about hundreds of years, I believe, maybe about a 400-year time span. Don't quote me on that. Something around that area of time. And of course, in that amount of time, <laughs> you can have a lot of change in the weaponry and equipment used. A lot of advancement or, I mean, not necessarily advancement. Of course, things don't always move forward and upwards, right? Uh, technology doesn't always have to advance. We can have periods where it dips downwards, but basically you will see a lot of change over that amount of time, which is why it also becomes even harder to generalize because you could be talking about someone who's 300 years before somebody else. These granted cavalrymen an unprecedented level of stability, which was crucial for both lancers and archers. With the stirrup, not only could a mounted archer attain far greater accuracy and range, but they were also able to even more efficiently execute the infamous Parthian shot. Defensively, light cavalry wore very little. However, we have evidence that heavier variants used quilted or metal scale blankets to cover hmm. the body of the horse with additional pieces added to protect vulnerable areas such as the face and neck. Right. Thus equipped, let us see how these soldiers were trained and organized into fighting units. And I wonder, anyone who knows a bit about cavalry history, and this is a very broad question, what you think sort of the height of cavalry was? Um, you know, I think specifically of, say, Western history. You know, when we talk about ancient history, we have the slow advancement of cavalry technology over time. And by the time you get to sort of the late Persian Empire, well, you have some pretty advanced stuff. But with the breakdown of the Sassanid Persian Empire and, you know, the decline of the Roman Empire, uh, there are less resources to be marshaled to put towards cavalry forces. Now, in the West, you know, we have a long time when there's a lot of squabbling states that don't have as many resources as, say, the Romans or the Persians did. You fast forward into the early modern era, you know, as we exit the Middle Ages, 
well, now we have a lot of bigger empires, states, who can wield these larger armies, more impressive cavalries. But of course, that's also the time when we see the rise of the firearm. And so cavalry very slowly starts to become less and less relevant. So I wonder when you guys think sort of the height or the highest importance of cavalry was specifically in the Western world. I'll keep it contained there because <laughs> if we go broader, then that would be an even bigger conversation than it already is. It's already an extremely broad topic. I'm just interested to hear y'all's thoughts on this topic. With regards to training, we know that Eastern horse archers were incredibly skilled. After all, many came from nomadic or semi-nomadic cultures whose way of life revolved around a mastery of the horse and bow. And this is absolutely key. This is why, say, the Roman Empire had so much trouble with horse archers because, yeah, of course, you can train up horse archers. But if we look at these nomadic peoples, and I think specifically of steppe nomadic peoples, but this is broader than just that. If we look at these nomadic peoples, they have been trained in horse archery from day one. Since they were very young, learning to ride, learning to shoot, I mean, that is an incredible level of expertise and skill. And if you're a sedentary people, like the Romans primarily were, and you want to train up your own horse archers, well, it's pretty difficult to reach that level of skill, which is why you might just, you know, hire mercenaries or hire auxiliaries who were nomadic peoples. They already have the skills. But this is absolutely key. If you can get these sorts of people in your army, who have this experience, then they're just about the best to fill the role, really. Here is how a Chinese historian describes this fact. Quote, the little boys start out learning to ride sheep and shoot birds and rats with a bow and arrow. Hmm. And when they get a little older, they shoot foxes and hares. All the young men are able to use a bow and act as armed cavalry. While this level of commitment was not practical beyond the steppe, an appreciation for such skills was deeply embedded into the culture of the East. Mm. Militaries of more sedentary background therefore strove to instill this sort of drill into their men. The Sasanians, for instance, are believed to have trained from the ages of 5 to 24. They learned all manner of martial arts, such as wrestling, archery, spear throwing, and equestrian skills, whilst also practicing physical conditioning, discipline, and teamwork. Right. And so you can see that the peoples of this time, the Sassanids in particular, recognized the expertise of those nomadic peoples, like I was just talking about, and they tried to mimic that. Now, I think still... If you want to find the best horse archers, you're going to go for one of these nomadic tribes who have been training since day one. Uh, sedentary peoples usually can't compete, but sedentary peoples like the Romans or the Sassanids are saying, you know what, they've got it right. Let's at least try and do what they're doing. Uh, or at least, you know, hire those nomadic peoples, bring them into our army, and maybe we can make some of our own through some very intense training regimens. We are told that these youths in training would often be instructed by professional veterans who bore the title of Andersbad, Ars Warrigan. It was a highly prestigious role whose qualifications were routinely subject to review. Hmm. Such personnel could be seen in regular military barracks, but were also apparently dispatched to villages and cities across the realm to keep the general populace well-practiced for war. Huh, wow. Once youths had reached a sufficient level of military proficiency, they would then be allowed into the ranks of the military proper. For the elite Savaran, this meant undergoing years of rigorous training discipline, and hard service through constant exercise in warfare and maneuvers. Sports such as polo, jousts, hunting, and arrow play further built up their skills. But education did not just involve physical tasks. Many knights were also drilled in intellectual courses involving writing, bookkeeping, logic games, song, dance, poetry, and more. 
<laughs> many Romans write admiringly of their professionalism, which in many cases rivaled or exceeded that of the legions. Interesting. I mean, that is some very high praise, not just because the Roman legions were very professional, but for the Romans to write highly of you, that means you must have been damn impressive because the Romans were really full of themselves, <laughs> to put it that way. Uh, though, like I said earlier, you know, the Romans and the Persians were sort of these great eternal rivals, but they did have a level of respect for each other. You know, the Romans and Sassanids, or the Romans and Persians, respected each other, I think, more than they respected anybody else. You know, these were two great empires who viewed themselves as the best. Um, but they had some respect for the rivals, so that is high praise. Uh, it's interesting that that sort of training would be involved, but not really unprecedented. I mean, if we're talking about this sort of elite cavalry force, which, to my impression, was maybe not dominated, but the noble houses were very involved in this elite cavalry force, it does make sense that you're not just training them to fight, but you're basically training them to fill this elite role to be gentlemen of a sort. That might be a more modern way of phrasing it. Uh, educating them in intellectual pursuits, music, all that kind of stuff. You're training them for more than just warfare. When it comes to organization, it is likely that the Sassanids employed a decimal system similar to the one employed by the earlier Archimedes. Mm. The smallest tactical subunit was a Vasht of 100 men, led by a Vasht Salar, 10 of which formed a Drasf of 1,000 men each of which had its own unique heraldry and battle standards according to their clans of origin. These were likely led by officers with the title of Hazamard, literally meaning thousand men. <laughs> the largest division of the Sassanid army was the Gund, led by the Gund Salah, that likely had around 10,000 men. Across the ranks would have been all manner of additional support staff meant to ensure the smooth running of a force. Yeah, and that's an interesting organization of troops. You know, our biggest group here is of 10,000 men. Though, if we look at some of the battles of this era between the Sassanids and the Arabs or the Sassanids and the Romans, you know, we're looking at armies that mobilized far more than 10,000 men. We're talking about tens, if not hundreds, or at least more than 100,000 individuals. And I imagine when you get to that point, <laughs> it becomes kind of difficult to organize if your biggest group uh, of men was 10,000. Um, but of course, on a usual basis, you're not dealing with armies of like 150,000. You're dealing with much, much, much smaller armies. So if you are regularly dealing with those larger armies, then you might want to think about sort of a higher degree of organization. Uh, I mean, I know if we talk about, say, the Roman Empire, when we get to the time of Caesar and Augustus and these civil wars, it starts becoming a little difficult to organize these Roman soldiers because they're dealing with so many more soldiers than they're used to. Uh, you know, new systems of organization in the military sort of have to be developed over time. Auxiliary units and mercenaries, meanwhile, were expectedly less structured and uniform than those of the Sasanian Savaran. Right. This issue was apparently addressed by assigning special Sardar officers to such forces to supervise them and ensure proper integration with the overall Espar. Hmm. So, what would this have looked like in battle? Let's see. Tactically speaking, such a diverse force as the Sassanid Espa had many options available to it, depending on which foe they were matched against. Early on, we must imagine that they fought in a similar manner to the Parthians. As such, horse archers were more lightly equipped and would have been deployed ahead of the army with instructions to harass the enemy force. That makes sense. This is a common way to use horse archers. Sort of, you can imagine light skirmishing troops. They are your front line. Uh, they ride out, harass the enemy soldiers, then ride back, and the main line moves forward. And of course, as we've talked about, the Sassanid army still has this heavy cavalry who can provide more of a core or a support wherever needed. So that is certainly one way to utilize horse archers, but 
Uh, as I'm sure we're about to see, they are very versatile. Researchers estimate these were capable of firing around one arrow every 10 seconds. Wow. Meaning that within one minute, a full Sassanid gun of horse archers could theoretically saturate a target area with 60,000 arrows. My goodness. Typical range for massed barrages was around 150 meters, while more precise targeting would be done within 50 meters. Such a deluge would slowly whittle enemy numbers and soften up formations for more dedicated attacks by heavy cavalry. Mm. Particularly stubborn units might be drawn out by feigned fight, <laughs> where they could be further bloodied using yep. the Parthian shot before eventually being isolated and run down. This sort of approach could be rinsed and repeated until victory was achieved and is yeah and this is a especially effective against an enemy who is not as organized or disciplined as you are right so you're filling them full of arrows now if your enemy is holding a strong line they're well supplied well armored and they can hold that line then that might not be so effective plus your feigned retreats if your enemy is disciplined then they won't fall for it so this may not be the most effective tactic but if you're facing an enemy who is less disciplined or less organized or uh, less well armored, less supplied than you are, this can be extremely effective. So once again, you know, different tactics, different enemies, depends on what situation you're dealing with. Best described at the Battle of Karai. Variants of this tactic certainly existed, one of which was the three wave attack. The way it worked is that a first wave of lancers would charge out, forcing the enemy to cluster together. Then, a second wave of horse archers would ride in to shoot the crowded hmm. foe. And finally, a third wave of lancers would thunder in to break the battered lines. The advantage of this approach was that it rapidly forced the enemy to adapt to different conditions. And in doing so, a fatal weakness would be exposed. Yeah. This was quite devastating on inexperienced troops. Yep. And that's exactly what I'm pointing out. You can see a lot of these strategies, and frankly, a lot of strategies in general, are basically a test of your opponent's discipline. You know, if your opponent is incredibly disciplined, then they can hold up against these different tactics. But if they're not, and of course it's a spectrum between you know, complete chaos and complete 100% discipline, depending on where they lie along that spectrum, they might fall sooner or later for some of these tactics that you're using, and then you can claim victory. But so long as a disciplined force held the line, they could weather the storm. Yep. Over time, the habitual rivals of the Sassanid would learn to adapt to this form <laughs> of warfare. It's for this reason that we see the S-Bar evolve over time as well. This meant deploying a wider mix of troop types such as super heavy cavalry, foot infantry, and elephants. <laughs> By the 6th century AD, this led to a new order of battle with three sections. Here, horse archers might screen the front, defend the left, or attack the right. Mm. Another notable change of later centuries was the merging of horse, archer, and lancer into a single composite warrior capable of acting in a highly flexible manner. Right, and t that's taking advantage of the versatility and flexibility of the horse archer, which I think is really one of their most important traits. Beyond this, horse archers could be employed in a myriad of other ways as scouts, raiders, pursuers, rear guards, or tactical reserves. Oh yeah. I mean, cavalry in general is very versatile. They just pointed out a bunch of ways that cavalry, or in this case, horse archers, can be used. You have so many different ways to deploy them um, because of that versatility. Let's now turn to an exploration of their service history. All right. A thorough accounting will be impossible, and so we will have to be sated with an overview of their far-reaching campaigns. In terms of Sassanid history, this all would have begun with the 3rd century AD revolt of King Ardashir against the Parthians, which culminated in the Battle of Hormozgan, 
in 224. Here, over 20,000 mostly mounted forces clashed in the open plains. Horse archers almost certainly traded heavy blows in the exchange, but it was ultimately the charge of the heavy cavalry which won Ardashir his throne. Well, and, you know, this is often how it works. Uh, I mean, you need different forces for different things, and heavy cavalry are usually great for when the enemy shows an opening, shows a weakness. They can charge right in and seal the deal, win the victory. I think horse archers are more known for their skirmishing, for softening up enemy troops, sort of providing that opening, that weakness. Though once again, this is all very versatile, and it can happen differently in different situations. In the decade that followed, his horse archers would continue to fight similar troops in the bid to take over the whole of the Parthian Empire. By the year 231, these would have reached the Roman Empire oh. and participated in Ardashir's raids against Roman Mesopotamia. Emperor Severus Alexander would lead a massive counterattack. This proved initially successful in the highlands of Armenia and northern Medea, but encountered significant troubles once they descended into the more open plains. Herodian describes the climax of the campaign during the Battle of Ctesiphon as follows. Quote, Ardashir attacked the... That is the Sassanid Persian capital, by the way, Tessaphon. ...Roman army unexpectedly with his entire force and trapped them like fish in a net. <laughs> the outnumbered Romans were unable to stem the attack of the Persian horde. They used their shields to protect those parts of their bodies exposed to the Persian arrows. Mm. Content merely to protect themselves, they offered no resistance. As a result, all the Romans were driven into one spot, where they made a wall of their shields and fought like an army under siege. Hmm. Hit and wounded from every side, they held out bravely as long as they could, but in the end, all were killed. Over the following years, Sassanid and Roman armies would fight a bloody series of wars across their contested border. The tide but yes they would uh, like we said eternal rivals they were constantly at each other's throats and i mean severus alexander was mentioned after him rome would fall into the crisis of the third century which was not a good time for the roman empire as the name might suggest the empire was constantly crumbling falling apart you know a, a lot of really big challenges and so the romans were especially weak against uh, Sassanid raids on their borderlands began to turn in the 240s AD during the reign of Shapur the first who ah. defeated Emperor Gordian at the Battle of Maishk. Yes, and we have some great Sassanid emperors like Shapur the first during this time of great chaos in Rome. Emperor Valerian at the Battle of Barbalassos uh. and finally at the Battle of Edessa. Unfortunately, History leaves us no details regarding the specific tactics for these glorious affairs. However, we can be sure that the horse archers played a key role in achieving victory by way of the various maneuvers we previously described. By this point, the Sassanids had rightly earned the respect of the Romans, who <laughs> increasingly sought to adopt eastern ways of war as a means to counter them. Yeah. This was especially true during the Byzantine Wars, which broke out... I think this is very true, and, you know, like I said, the Parthians were also rivals of the Romans, but as we continue into the Sassanid Empire, this rivalry continues. The Sassanids deal a lot of defeats to the Romans. Uh, the Parthians had as well, but the Sassanids really give the Romans a couple of tough blows, not to mention that... You know, Rome starts shifting eastwards, uh, obviously, especially after the collapse of the Western Empire. So Rome becomes more uh, oriented towards the east. You can sort of see how the Sassanid Empire becomes more important to them. Their rivalry becomes bigger, more important. Uh, also, I think the respect from the Romans to the Sassanids becomes uh, more prevalent. During the 5th and 6th centuries, 
One of the great climaxes of these struggles would take place as the legendary General Belisarius fought a furious series of campaigns against King Carvat. Yeah, gotta be one of the greatest generals in Roman history, serving under Justinian, obviously a very famous and great emperor. Belisarius was absolutely Justinian's man. He would go wherever he needed to be, whether it was reconquering Roman Africa, reconquering Italy, or heading out east to fight off the Sassanids. Here, both sides cleverly leveraged horse archers, ambushes, feigned fights, pit traps, and mailed charges to brutal mm. effect. Yeah, and if you want to talk about adaptability in warfare, of course, this is about the Sassanid Empire, but, you know, the Romans are a perfect place to point to, uh, especially considering after the fall of the West, the Eastern Roman Empire would survive for a thousand years more. The Romans had to be extremely adaptable uh, in terms of warfare and, well, everything else, really. But it wasn't just against the Byzantines that the Espar were tested. They also frequently fought massive wars against the hostile tribes of Central Asia. Yeah. Invading armies of the White Huns and later the Turks, for instance, precipitated cavalry on cavalry battles of epic proportions, of which we are only dimly aware of. Hmm. On other fronts, the Sassanids engaged with yet more emerging foes, such as the Arabs of the South. Initial. Yeah, well, they engaged with the Arabs on several levels. It First, uh, you know, early on, we're talking about a lot of Arab raids on the more settled empires, like the Parthians and the Romans. There were a lot of Arab raids. And then, I don't know if it'll be mentioned here, but of course we get to the emergence of the Caliphate. And then that is a whole nother level of warfare between the Sassanid Empire and uh, the Arab forces. The campaigns and the building of new fortifications were at first able to keep these various foes at bay. But yes. By the seventh century, the Sassanid Empire was thoroughly exhausted. Well, there was really what we have at the end of the Sassanid Empire. The Sassanids and the Romans fight this massive war where they almost wipe each other out, really. But the Sassanids get quite close to taking over Roman territory. Uh, the Romans are basically only saved by the great Emperor Heraclius, who defeats them, and then goes campaigning through Sassanid territory, really doing a number on the Sassanids. So both empires are left very weakened, and around that time, we see the rise of the Caliphate. Now, there's been a lot of Arab raids before, but the emergence of Islam really unites a lot of these feuding Arab tribes in a way that has never happened before. So they become this unified, very powerful force you know, hitting the Roman and Sassanid empires at a time when they're already weak, Rome manages to survive in a diminished state, but the rise of the Caliphate is too much for the Sassanid empire, and they get defeated time and time again until the empire itself crumbles under that pressure. This apparent weakness was identified by the Rashidun Caliphate, yep. which now launched its devastating invasion. Unfortunately, we are... And, you know, we talk about the Rashidun Caliphate or the forces of the Caliphate more broadly. They used cavalry very effectively. I'm not necessarily talking about horse archers, though surely horse archers as well, but cavalry more broadly played an extremely important role in the military of the Caliphate. They were very skillfully used uh, in a lot of these battles that are being referred to here. We are left in the dark regarding the specific involvement of the Persian horse archers in the stubborn resistance of the Espar. Mm. Ultimately, however, they and the Sassanid Empire would fall. Yeah. Yet, this was not to be the end of such warriors. Oh no. For centuries to come, their descendants would carry on the millennia-long tradition of horse and bow, under the banner of Islam. Yeah. But that story will have to wait for another time. <laughs> we hope you've appreciated this exploration of the woefully underappreciated history of the Sassanids and their impressive military. Please let us know which units you'd like to see covered next and be sure to head over to our Patreon.
All right, and hey, do the same for this channel. Check out the Patreon linked down below. I agree. I think the Sassed Empire is very underappreciated. And by that, I mean it's not covered as much as it should be. I mean, I think, first off, the Romans get all the attention in the ancient world. And then, not to mention, by the time we get to the Sassanids, you know, we are a, a little later on in antiquity. Not too late. We're talking around, like, the 200s. But as we go through the existence of the Sassanid Empire, you know, 3rd century, 4th, 5th, 6th, this time period is a lot less popular <laughs> than, say, the late Republican era of the Roman Empire, which hogs a lot of the attention. Um... And if we're talking about that time period, then, you know, we're talking mainly about the Parthians, not the Sassanids who would come later. So, yeah, I do think they're underappreciated. Um, I thought this was a great video. You know, it was real interesting to look at this specific unit. Uh, it gives us a chance to look at the Sassanid military and the Sassanid Empire more broadly. A lot of real interesting stuff. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, then please leave a like. Uh, and by the way, y'all should check out my Discord. It's linked down below. We have a Discord server where we talk about uh, videos on the channel. People give lots of recommendations. And mainly, we talk about history more broadly. It's a good place to be. Uh, there's a lot of active members. So please, if you're interested in talking about history, join the Discord. It's linked down below. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you're all having a good day today. And I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.